Hi friends, this is a video about a conversation I have with my friend, a uh, good friend, and photographer Michael Duke. He is a Houston local, and I've been meaning to have a conversation with him about his experience experiencing and capturing Hurricane Harvey. And it was a fantastic conversation. Now, on the side of capturing this conversation to share with you guys, there's the audio side, which is the first priority. And I, I, that turned out really fantastic. It went out to my podcast. You're welcome to listen to it as you're driving on the road to go get your taco or coffee or coffee taco. Those are a new thing that the hipsters are into, I hear. Uh, but the video side was a bit experimental. Long story short, my computer completely overloaded trying to record this thing. And it's all there, but you'll see in a minute. It doesn't look great. It's not where I want to end up and I'm going to have to go about other methods of pulling this off. But the audio is is solid. I think audio is the more important side of the video, so I'm glad that that's at least good for you guys. But anyway, here that is. Enjoy. I just wanted to preface it with that so you don't go, what is this crap? Enjoy the conversation. Hi, friends. Welcome to another video slash episode of the James Red podcast. Hopefully this will actually be a video. This is going to be an interesting experiment to some extent with uh, some, some new method of going about some things here and recording a video. Uh, it, it Worst comes to worst, it's literally just going to be audio. So we'll see how it goes. But today I have with me here the lovely uh, Michael Duke. We are, we are friends and he has, he, I always love to bring him along on these sorts of uh, conversations because where my friend Will, which I used in the last one, uh, it's it's really fun to talk to him about certain artistic things around composition and this and that. We have our own little niche of things to talk about. What I love to talk about with Michael is the story and how important the uh, how important photography is for documentation, along with the dynamic of um, composition and this and that, which is something I yeah, I love to talk about. So, Michael, how's it going? It's going all right. Thanks. I really appreciate, again, you uh, letting me be part of your wonderful project here. Uh, it's always nice to uh, hang out with fel fellow photography lovers and enthusiasts. And uh, your enthusiasm gives me enthusiasm. So it's always a nice like uh, opportunity to get myself kind of refocused on projects after talking with you. So I appreciate that. So good. I, I love it. And I love uh, um, I, these conversations are so healthy for me. These are these are sort of the coffee shop conversations that uh, I don't get enough of because I, I'm, I'm working from home and I don't interact with other humans that much. Luckily, I have a wife. We talk about things sometimes. Sometimes we interact with each other. Normally, I have earbuds in my ears. So it's 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 kind of a weird we're in the future it's a weird thing it's kind of like that movie with bruce willis where it's it was like the surrogate or whatever we're getting there <laughs> it's gonna be bad well i'm gonna come up and visit you so i'm gonna drag you out of the house yes we'll, uh, oh that's we'll, another we'll... thing you're gonna come visit uh so i'm exactly. excited i'm excited about that hopefully we can pull that together that'll be a lot of fun and oh For my sure. gosh the videos anyway we're going to talk a little bit today about your experience because you're from Houston with Hurricane Harvey even though Harvey has now made its way out of the news cycle which is about 10 hours long at this point <laughs> and by 10 hours I mean 45 seconds and it all has to do with Trump uh, we're gonna I, that doesn't matter to me because stories are stories and I think that there are a lot of interesting stories that I whenever these things happen I I'm the one that sort of thrives on the thing that was in the news for a second for a lot longer than that second. I'm really interested in learning about what actually happened and um, the, the stories of community and how people sort of pulled themselves together. And I, I know that there's so many wonderful stories to, to be had there. Uh, but you are a photojournalist who, who lives in Houston. This is your hometown. No, hometown. Did you grow up here? You didn't grow up here. I did grow up here, actually. Okay, yeah. great. I uh, almost my entire life. So, gotcha. So th this is a this is very much part of who you are, and I I want to hear about your experience with what happened. And so first off, I mean, we'll kind of go into different uh, areas of it, and then we're gonna look at some photos from you as well as a couple other photojournalists that I came across. But what was sort of the timeline? of Hurricane Harvey in your life? 
so just, what was the beginning of that timeline? Like when did it sort of start becoming something that you went, oh, this is serious? Uh, yeah, I guess about a week before when we started like seeing these satellite images of this storm kind of forming and all the uh, apocalyptic, uh, you know, news reports, um, watching this storm like approaching the Texas Gulf Coast and the storm was like literally the inside, almost the size of the entire state of Texas, which is <laughs> obviously one of the biggest states in the in the union here mm -hmm. so uh mm -hmm. that got us that got us a little concerned um we uh hit the grocery stores along with you know friends uh and bought out everything we possibly could and um i guess about a day and a half before the storm we decided okay we're not going out anymore um to a false sense of security because the first day or so we didn't flood yet um, like we had in previous storms. And so we kind of got a little, I think, too confident. Um, but then that and landfall, by the way, like I think on August 25th, uh, which is a Friday night. And so by like Saturday night, Sunday morning, we started to really uh, not see a let up in the rain at all. And the bayous then began to overflow. And once that happened, I mean, we're at sea level and our streets are designed to flood. So, um, you know, we got almost 60 inches of rain, uh, which is just insane. So, you know, by Sunday we were screwed and we, we realized it. So <laughs> that's kind of the timeline. We've been like in uh, recovery mode ever since now, almost yeah, going yeah, on yeah. six months. No, so you guys are still not out of the woods in a, in a sense. I mean, you're kind of no. out of the woods. You see the shoreline at all? Can you see the shoreline at all, or is it just all the shoreline? Can you see the edge of the woods at all, or is it just you're <laughs> sort of in the middle of nowhere still? You know, every time it rains, like, the anxiety level just skyrockets here. We had some rain last week. I think we're going to get some again this weekend. And the bayous seem to fill up a lot faster than they do Um on you know nurse and wish we were out of the woods but people who flooded are still not back in their homes and they're all just kind of in this perilous limbo situation where one small crisis could really kind of tip things over um i can't tell you how many people that i know who have gotten divorced in the last couple months because you know, crises like this really put a strain and expose cracks that may already be there. So we're not out of the woods yet. I think it's going to be, be a couple of years probably before we're able to really, I think, rediscover kind of some normalcy. Um, thankfully, you know, the economy down here is still pretty good. Uh, we're an energy hub. So as long as people are wanting to buy natural gas, I think we'll be okay, at least financially. It's the emotional part that I think is going to take a long time so sure and I, one thing that I've, that i'm always impressed with this is when i love america the most is when things like this happen we have tremendous infrastructure compared to other countries to deal with situations like this so true so true mm -hmm. um and as we kind of figure it out and I, something that we're going to get to in a second that is that demonstrates this is one of the things i love about your photos in this case is that it shows off how important community is and, and uh, it gets away from the, just the dramatic side of it, which I'm going to ask you about in a second, but, uh, but it gets away from the dramatic side of it and in, it shows off how important it is to have a strong community that when something happens, they go, well, everything's broken, but we're going to figure it out. Hmm. Yeah, and that's really kind of the focus of, like, I would say my reporter's photography in general, but in particular with these kind of, you know, natural disasters. I mean, I write for a community newspaper, and yeah, we try to get the dramatic photos in, but um, we're, well, I think, more interested in kind of the long-form storytelling and, um, you know, the close proximity and access that we have to people over the long term, I think, really kind of influences the type of photography that, you know, that we do for the newspaper and covering this story. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is good. That's so important. I, I don't think yeah. we have enough of that. <laughs> have you? Did you have any sort of, I, 
I know you did because you told me right after about this, but did you have any sort of dramatic experiences that came about during this? Something that was that was a little bit intense. Yeah, well, so on the personal side, um, our garage was flooding. I guess it was Sunday night, so on there taking turns bailing water out of the garage and all of a sudden we see this like large umbrella like one of these beach umbrellas kind of coming down the street and there are two people basically with very little clothes on um under the umbrella and this driving rain and we kind of flagged them over to come under come you know into the shelter of our garage even though it was partially flooded um apparently they were a couple miles away their car got stuck and they were trying to get home to the woman's mother who was trapped on a countertop as like more than four feet of water were coming into her house and she was disabled and this poor woman was freaking out to try to get to her mom so we uh waited for a, a short kind of reprieve in the in the rain and we threw them in my car and uh we were able to drive them close as we could a couple blocks from this woman's mother's house and uh they were able to get her in and got her moved up into the attic and on our way back home unfortunately the rain really started to come down and my car got stuck and my wife and i had to uh our house through waist high water um for almost a mile so that was a little intense (laughs) i'd I'd say i and uh I, I think it's it's really interesting to hear that from the point of view of somebody who like hear the entire story of how all of these things play out and how people tend to get stuck in things you you see a lot of people from the from the outside you see a lot of people who get their car stuck and your first thought is that idiot like why did you drive into the flood <laughs> but uh but in your situation i mean you ended up in that situation because you're trying to help somebody you're trying to help somebody yeah. else who was in a, a worse situation. Yeah, I like again. I like your optimism, but you know, r- looking back and like you know, I put my wife's life in danger. I put my own life in danger because my wife insisted on going with me if I was going to take these people home. So, yeah, yeah. yes, obviously, in the moment, I was doing something that I thought was going to hopefully help save somebody's life. But you know, we risked our own lives and. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's it was it's tough one decision. of those really tough. I, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the yeah, person really to, to Monday call. morning quarterback. Isn't that the phrase? I'm not going to be the person <laughs> to do that. Cause what you did sounds quite noble to me. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Um, uh, I, uh, we got lucky. I mean, we got out with our lives. So, and thank God they, uh, the people were, were helping also got out with their lives. Uh, the woman came back by our house a couple of weeks later just to kind of say thank you, which was kind of cool. So, mm-hmm. uh, did you, did you come across any, any emotional experiences that, uh, within this? I mean, what, what was, what were some parts that were kind of emotionally meaningful for you? Like during the flood or during that particular episode? Uh, dur- no, during the in- the entire experience of mm. dealing with this, up until, you know, an hour before right now, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's I mean, there's been so many. It's uh, hard to choose one. But um, in prior flooding events, thank God, my family has personally been able to stay high and dry. But this time around, unfortunately, my grandmother who lives just a couple blocks from one of the bayous in Southwest Houston, uh, her house flooded. And that was a really emotional experience because that was her home with my grandfather for, uh, almost gosh, they were married 67 years. So, you know, over 50 years, they lived in that house together. It's the house that my mom and her siblings grew up in. Actually, when I first moved back to Houston after college, I lived there for a short period of time and my grandfather died in 2011. And so my grandmother's entire life with my grandfather basically was destroyed in this house. And we were having to haul all that stuff out to the curb to throw away. Um, and happened during that process, I think on day three, we finally made our way to the back bedrooms of the house. And um, my 
brother had carried out an old suitcase that was at the bottom of a closet. Thank God my mother was there and, you know, she, there was that little voice in her head. She said, you know, I should check to see what's in that, that suitcase. And my mom opened it up and there were about a thousand negatives and photo prints dating back to like the early 19 teens that had belonged to my great grandfather um, with all this early history of that side of the family. I had never seen most of these and we spent 12 hours that day um, resubmerging all that material and then stringing clotheslines crisscrossed all across the backyard. We bought out the dollar store and clothespins and we hung up about 600 negatives and prints and were able to save a tremendous amount of those materials. Um, and right, right now I'm in the process of scanning those negatives and cleaning them up and sharing them with the rest of the family. Cause most of us have never seen this before. So, yeah, well, I mean, that's uh, leads perfectly into the, the value of photography. <laughs> I mean, I, I love, I love this, this idea that, even if you're not compositionally brilliant with a photo and you're, you're looking at photos from a long time ago that, um, that, you know, it's, it's your, your, your aunt took it and it's like at this weird Dutch angle and there's, and it's, you don't know exactly what's going on. And you're like, whose legs are those? That's uncle Tim. That's uncle Tim's legs. I think, uh, it's either uncle Tim or cousin Jim. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I guess your family has incredibly generic names, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, it's a. Uh, it doesn't take away from the fact that the photos are ha have an emotional story to tell. And then you like if you add on top of that the layer of of uh, cr photographic thoughtfulness that me and you both strive for in our photos. You you end up with another level of, a, of an em emotional experience. And that's what we're trying to go for. But it, I mean, regardless, you still, the, a photo is emotional on its own. Uh, yeah, I agree. And, you know, photography, certainly generational photography, I think it really kind of shows that we do have all these links in a chain that connect us back generations. And um, again, it's been really kind of a fun process I'll just grab you a brick and show you what I'm talking about. Just one sec. Oh, grab it. Please grab it. He's going to get a brick for some reason. I don't know what a brick has to do with this conversation. I don't know why it's helpful. So when I said like hundreds or close to thousands of prints here, I mean, that's what we're talking about. So like this is just, just one handful of these old negatives um, that I'm in the process of like scanning and repairing. Um, Whoa. It's it's amazing though. I mean, obviously these are like I think one twenty seven maybe. So they're big fat negatives. Um, What's so the, the ratio detail and the that? resolution is incredible. But also they're it's nitrate film, which is in this older you know emulsion and backing, and it's a lot more stable and durable than like modern film is. So this stuff obviously took a huge beating. Um, in the storm, never mind the fact that uh, some of these are a hundred years old almost, um, but they look pretty good. <laughs> I'll yeah. have to send you some. Do you, do you think that the, the nitrate film side of things helped and them being preserved? <laughs> yeah, apparently it is a, uh, a more durable, um, negative as a result of being an older technology. It's kind of like when everything used to be made out of metal and now it's all plastic and disposable. Mm. So Thank God these were from that age because we still have them. Well, <laughs> so I don't know if everything else is going to last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's funny that you you've uh, you're saying that because I've been one of my I have a lot of random obsessions that I <coughs> dig into. One of my random obsessions has involved I'll just say it has involved ancient Egypt, and hmm. they and there's a lot of debate around the pyramids. Like we seem to think we actually we we know uh, when they were built and and how they were built, who built them, what they were for. But there's actually a lot of debate around it in the in the scientific community, if you will. And one of the things they say is that it's amazing that they were built out of stone because they it's hard to make stone go away. And they were, yep. if in, you know, 3,000 years from now, if the world is, is still an active planet, 
uh, Mount, they say that Mount Rushmore is going to be something that will actually stick around, right? Because it's, it's a mountain. However, uh, our hard drives probably have no chance. <laughs> yeah, what we plug them into, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, well, and... And that's why I'm still shooting film today. Uh, in fact, I'm shooting more film like right now since this hurricane than I ever have previously. I think for that exact reason, I want the longevity of it. You know, the physicality of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, that's awesome. So, uh, very quickly before we start talking about your photos a little bit, what did you what did you hope to capture in this entire experience? Hmm. And did you meet some of those goals? So, I mean, I guess really just in very general terms, I wanted to capture, you know, the human impact um, and then more specifically, like the direct impact that this has had on the community that I cover. I work for a Jewish newspaper and um, about 70 percent of our Jewish community in Houston lives near this bayou in southwest Houston. And some of these folks now have flooded like three times in three years and uh you know so i was really kind of focused on i guess basically following some of these storylines that pre-existed harvey um families that have flooded on memorial day 2015 and then a tax day flood on 2016 and you know compared their experiences with people who flooded for the first time um have I met these goals? I hope so. I mean, you mentioned that this story is no longer national news and, you know, that's obviously the case because Trump gets on Twitter, you know, every morning at 6 a.m. and gives us a whole new cycle. He enjoys um, that. But in Houston, I mean, every media outlet has a new Harvey story every single day. The story has not died. Uh, in fact, it's strengthened in some ways um, because, how much uh, of an economic impact the storm has had. They still don't know how many homes flooded. Uh, the latest estimate on vehicles was over a million cars um, in the greater Houston area. Wow. Um, and people are now beginning to elevate their houses and the new building code is you have to build up <laughs> 10 feet. And so they have these brand new like construction companies who are coming in and are literally like jacking homes up 10 feet and then like propping them up on these guys or cinder blocks. And just the whole engineering behind that is just, it's remarkable. So we're getting all these new great stories to cover as media. Yeah. Uh, but again, my specific focus is really to the, on how this is impacting them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, well, let's take a look at some of these photos, and I'm going to share my... Okay. First, I'm going to pull my screen up here, and then I'm going to share my screen with you. Hopefully, this flows uh, incredibly smoothly. S- and, smoothly. And some of the images I sent you were from Harvey, but I also had sent you a few from previous floods, 2015 and 2016, again, because I kind of see this as being you know, a greater story that started before Harvey and certainly will keep going Gotcha. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well into the okay. next storm season. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, so can you see me? Can you? Yep. See, uh, no, I see me. You see you. <laughs> okay, okay. I see. Yeah. So let's see here. How about that? Yep. I see the How's that photo. Yep. You? All right. So yep. I'm gonna minimize this this guy here. Oopsies. Oh gosh, what did I do? All right, we're gonna minimize that. There's you. I mean, as beautiful as you are. We're gonna minimize that. Mm. Hopefully my CPU will calm down a little bit. Good gosh. All right. So, uh, by the way, Michael, if if, if there's any photo yeah. that I, I tried to curate the the photos that were my personal favorites, <laughs> but if there's yeah. any anything in specific that I did not add in here that you a uh, photo that you specifically want to talk about, uh, let me know okay. and I will I will go find it. Can you hear me? Hello. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay great. Now. Very good. So, uh, so first, I I'm gonna guess that this is not a photo taken by you, but this is a photo of you, and we have a photo of you on top of a ladder in the middle of. I'm guessing that's the synagogue there, or no? So yes, this is a synagogue, and actually, it was taken by me. Um, oh. I put my other little Fuji on a chair, and I had uh, and I, you can control these cameras with an app. And so, but I'll explain what's going on here. So, 
multiple synagogues flooded during Harvey, and the largest synagogue in Houston is called Bethy Shuren, flooded for the first time ever. Um, and the Jewish High Holy Days were like right around the corner, and basically the largest synagogue in Houston was homeless. And mm -hmm. so one of the mega churches in Houston, Lakewood Church, uh, Joel Osteen, maybe you guys have heard of him. Mm -hmm. I think he's on TV. Um, decided to open up the doors of Lakewood Church to host the synagogue. Um, because of the interfaith thing and the fact that they were going to have all these important um, holiday services in a church for people who are Jewish who aren't used to being in a church, the uh, synagogue got the idea to basically digitally recreate the sanctuary at the synagogue church through all the jumbotrons that are up in Lakewood Church. Lakewood used to be where the Houston Rockets played basketball. So they have these amazing jumbotrons. And oh. uh, so the synagogue has some very distinctive art pieces in the sanctuary. And so he kind of volunteered my services to digitally recreate the way the sanctuary alert looked. And then um, we we basically projected that at the church. And I was talking with one of my friends who works for Fuji Film in the Houston area. His name is Matt. Awesome guy. Um, Hi, Matt. We basically, we need really high resolution images to be able to like pull this feed off. And so um, like within a couple minutes of me emailing him, he called back saying that he has an entire kit of Fuji's new medium format GFX camera four lenses or whatever, and then I can borrow it for however long I need it. So uh, he uh, he let me borrow that camera, which I have in the hand here. So basically, I'm up on the ladder, you know, creating these images. And what you're seeing kind of in the background is what used to be the sanctuary. All that blank space used to be seating that all had to get ripped out. Um, and then in the background, you see some boxes and some stacks of chairs. Those were obviously things that they were trying to salvage. And then those weird plastic tubes that are kind of cutting across horizontally um, were hooked up to uh, this like ventilation system because it was very damp. By the building, they set up these uh, these large plastic uh, air ducts that pump in warm, dry water, uh, dry air. To yeah, basically for, for anyone who can't see this, these are like giant hamster tubes. <clears throat> Yeah, there you go. Great description. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. Um, yep. <laughs> gotcha. So it was it was cool. I shot I think for two or three days, and uh, it was really meaningful. And somehow I need to like come up with twelve grand so I can go buy that camera system because it is a hell of a camera. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. It's. <clears throat> I mean, I was gonna say like the when you first started telling me you took the photo, I was like, man, that camera you're holding in your hand is pretty impressive. It can take photos of you <laughs> from f from the other side of the room. Amazing. Yeah, and the only reason why I'm not usually in the business of taking pictures of myself, but uh, I wanted to show Fuji what I was doing with their system. Uh, you know, took these pictures and then gave them to Matt so he can thank his higher ups. And uh, anyway, it was pretty cool. Totally. So, so yeah, if you want to get a free Fuji camera, just have a natural disaster. There you go. <laughs> That's the first lesson of today. All right, we're gonna move on to the next photo. What what so what, yes. what we have here basically is a the front of a synagogue, in a low angle of a hose spraying a lot of water. It doesn't. It, it looks like it should not be spraying this much water from inside a building. Tell us about yeah. it. Yeah. So this is uh, the an Orthodox synagogue that has now flooded. I think. Uh, half a dozen times in like 10 years it's just it's catastrophic in fact this sunday they're actually going to be knocking this building down um because they just have had enough and so yeah their sanctuary space is kind of a little lower than the rest of the building and i think it took in eight feet of water during harvey mm. and for i think seven or eight days they had these industrial pumps you know, long after uh, the rain had stopped, um, running 24-7 for almost a week, basically pumping terrible water um, out of, uh, of the building. Um, I try to get people in my photographs, but uh, 
this one I thought um, you know didn't need somebody in there because basically you couldn't get close to it anyway because uh, it was pretty toxic water and the public was not allowed to be in these areas. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a bit. I, I understand that's a big thing with flooding is all the water mixes in with not so good water. Yeah, I mean it's from the bayou and like you know again we're like an oil and gas town so our water quality is pretty sketchy to begin with in some places and um I mean it's wild like again you would talk about stories that are still kind of unfolding um the cancer rate is uh has climbed in the last couple of years and there's some speculation that that's you know certainly flood and hurricane related for people who have been exposed there's been certain pockets of Houston neighborhoods where you know, there has been very clear contamination and uh, the health, public health situation in those areas is really scary right now. So it's, well, it shows just how vast the and ongoing the impact is of something like this, even yeah. after the water. Go you think the water just goes down and you're like, well, let's uh, let's pick up all the things and move the cars out of the middle of the road and then let's get going again. But there's so there's so much there's so many lasting effects. You know, just now our problems are really kind of beginning to start in some of those cases. Yeah, totally. it's, it's kind of scary. Totally. Um, uh, just imagine how <laughs> how how much more multiplied it is for a third world country, for example, like when Haiti had the earthquake. Haiti, yeah. Just, I mean, just... Uh, hard to imagine that people have the ability to, to bounce back. I mean, Puerto Rico is not supposed to be a third world country, but... <laughs> 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 like they're in pretty dire straits still. And again, mm -hmm. when's the last time we heard a major news story about the situation in Puerto Rico nationally? It's, it's really kind of sad. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Okay. So let's see, here's the next one. If it'll load, there we go. Now this one, this one, I, I this one's yeah. really interesting. We have a guy grabbing two chairs and dragging them across the floor of, uh, I'm going to guess that's another synagogue. And, uh, he's sludging through the water with his, with his feet covered in water. Uh, trying to move these chairs around and reorder some stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, so this is actually the uh, the inside of the sanctuary of the building that we just previously saw with the water pump. Uh, so this is what it looked like inside, I think, four days later. Um, uh, yeah, so obviously this building has flooded multiple times before because typically in a sanctuary you have, like, pew seating, you know, that's, like, built-in wooden... Uh, like you see in a church, but uh, this synagogue, because it's been wrecked so many times, hasn't been able to afford to install pew seating. So they just now have, you know, basic chairs kind of sitting in there. And yeah, yeah. I mean, what I guess strikes me about this particular image is that, you know, we know how toxic the water is and everything, but this guy is in there barefoot, you know, and the exposure of that uh, is very troubling you know, to me personally, but this is mm -hmm. kind of the scene that was, uh, was happening there, you know, almost a week later. Well, it's, it's a situation where you're like, if you live in this community, you're like, what do you do? What, what's more important that you do, you know, you risk getting, uh, you risk getting sick or that you sort of fix whatever's broken for everybody. In yeah. The, community? the immediate situation. And the other thing I think is remarkable too, is like, probably this guy's house flooded i mean so many people's houses flooded because this is an orthodox synagogue where a lot of people actually live in the neighborhood because they walk to the synagogue because you're not supposed to drive on the sabbath um according to that uh you know that 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 branch of judaism and um you know, this guy is yet still taking time out of his life to make sure that his house of worship is also going to be okay besides his own house, you know, and it just shows kind of the commitment and the people have to their synagogue there and how important it is. Man, that's straight out of a biblical story. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of knowing the flood. In fact, it was funny you mentioned that because uh, not this flood, but 2015 when the synagogue Bar Mitzvah that weekend. A Bar Mitzvah is like a life cycle event when boys turn 13 and they, you know, in the eyes of Jewish law, become a man. Uh, and the kid whose Bar Mitzvah was the weekend of the flood was his name was Noah, of course. Noah the flood. So kind of a cruel, cruel irony. Yep. Oh man, that's crazy. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so that was a good story for us to report. Obviously, you know, <laughs> a little, a little humor at a very dark time. It was destined. It was to be. It was yeah, God's poor will. Guy. <laughs>
Wow, that's funny. Okay, next photo. Uh, so this one, we're starting to get into a little bit more of the rescue effort side of things. We have a boat uh, cutting through the water, a couple of rescue workers in it. We have a highway in the background with cars on it, and we have a, some, a couple of cars down yep. it, downstream in the water, not in good shape. And then we have a guy in a Jeep driving behind the boat, using his Jeep to its fullest potential. <laughs> yeah, Jeep I don't think uh, they, uh, so the guys in the boat are fire department and this Jeep, uh, to turn around, you know, moments after this shot was taken. But if you follow the, uh, the, the lake here and go underneath the overpass, you'll see the bayou. So you can see kind of the level of overflow we're dealing with here. Um, and it was like, you know, these makeshift rescues um, with you know, people in pontoon boats and SUVs being stupid trying to get through uh, on one of the stupid ones, too, because remember, I got my car wrecked. Um, but <laughs> It was noble. It was noble, Mike. Yeah, 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 I like your interpretation better than mine. <laughs> but uh, again, though, like you see, it's like a clear day, right? So the, the rain is long gone, but the water just stuck around. I mean, it took several days to even have a lot of these roads be passable again. Um, and... Uh, scary the bridge you're looking at in the background um the water was actually pretty much up to the top of that bridge and a lot of the rescues that were happening people actually were taken to that overpass and dropped off on high ground there either by helicopter or boat and then put in the back of like dump trucks and then taken to public shelters or churches or whoever was taking people in at that moment so what's it what's um, it like seeing your entire town underwater it's very surreal um i during this flood my wife and i bought a house um almost a year ago and we actually don't we used to live in this part of town where we're looking at in the photo Um, oh you would have been in bad shape bought away from there intentionally like we don't want to be by a bayou um you know the initial flooding event this time around i missed um but you know i was there a day or day or two later but um it's it's hard you know you kind of go into crisis mode though at the same time like and not be a journalist in these situations because i've never not been one but, you know, my instinct is two things, you know, I need to go make sure my personal family is okay, but I also need to go grab my camera and notepad because I got to get to work. This is going to be potentially the biggest story I'm going to write this year. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, you just kind of put your head down and you go to work and you kind of compartmentalize the trauma of the situation until, you know, you don't have to be turning around upwards of 10 stories, you know, in a 48 hour period, which is kind of what I was doing. I mean, uh, for this, for this flood, you know, I've written probably 200 stories, uh, and photo essays at this point, you know, almost six months later. So, and I really haven't probably processed a lot of the trauma yet either. Um, just certainly about it, um, kind of here and there, but, I'm sure it'll hit me at some point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sure. I, when I, I'm, I'm sure there, there is somewhat of the effect. Now, I mean, you're not in Syria. Uh, you, you haven't no. watched people get their their legs blown off, so it, it's not quite at that level. But at the same time, I, I do believe that you're probably hiding behind the camera to some extent to what's going totally. on. Totally, you absolutely nailed it. That's a very good way to put it. It's uh, in a way a blessing, right? Because mm-hmm. you don't have to deal with it, but at the same time, I've been uh, pent up somewhere. Uh, the probably harder it's going to hit you at some point when it finally gets out. But you know, yeah. that's yeah. what we got to do, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank God you lost some property, but thank God you uh, you exactly kept some people. You kept the people, you know. Yep. Okay. Number yeah. Four. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I clear my throat there. I have a jug. By the way, I have a a, a cup of water and then a gallon jug of water beside my desk right now (laughs) to continually replenish my water source. I'm using this as a means to become a more healthy human. You're supposed to drink a lot of water in a day, and I'm doing it. I like your attitude. Okay, so uh, the next photo I want to look at is 
we have a car. We have a, a, another photo of the river, maybe a different one, I yep. guess. Is it the same one? Yeah, it's actually uh, it's nearby. It's like a block away. Uh, and what you're seeing, and unfortunately, I was pushed out of the situation, so I didn't get the uh, the shots that I really wanted to. But there's apparently a stranded motorist in that middle car. Um, and so you've got these two SUVs that are actually trying to get that to that individual. Um, again, the authorities kind of pushed everybody back, and uh, so I didn't get anything beyond that. But you know, for me, what was remarkable about the, about the scene was the fact that, like, obviously the authorities, the first responders, can't even get to people yet, and so average citizens, neighbors, people, complete strangers. Uh, we're risking their own lives to like help each other out. Um, mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, that car, a lot of the initial. Re- go, sorry, sorry. I, I was going to say that car, oh, yeah. the car is up to the, the windshield in there. And yeah. And then yep. you, you have three other cars. You have another car that's going to be in that same situation very shortly. And then a Jeep and a truck. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, it's very scary. And, you know, my assumption is, I guess, if your car is fully electric, uh and your doors happen to be locked and you can't bust your window and your car dies like i don't know maybe you you can't open your doors i mean certainly i saw people climbed on the top of their roofs of their car waiting for rescue but this particular scene the person was actually still inside you Um, you like to think that you could get yourself out of that situation but it would be so easy to be in a situation where you don't have anything to bust the window you can't get out yeah that car becomes your coffin I mean, the first thing I did after this last major storm was I went and bought one of those little safety hammers. I actually bought life jackets. Um, I mean, why would you need life jackets in your house? But now we have life jackets, you know, God forbid it's ever needed. But it really certainly uh, makes you think about things that you never thought you'd have to think about. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah, you don't you don't get serious about that stuff until the emotion. The, there's an emotional reason to get serious about that stuff. Yep. Yep. Okay. Let's see. Uh, next one. This one. Uh, whoop. Maybe. There we go. All right. Another photo from inside a synagogue. We have a guy. Uh, it looks like the some, one that some more cleanup synagogue efforts. Was... Exactly. So this is uh, a few days after that other one where the guy was moving the chairs. In fact, the guy in the green shirt who's still wearing the same clothes. I believe this was two days later. I mean, so you can still just see going the at it. water there. Yeah, and so you got this, you know, people basically just bailing this stuff out with trash cans at this point. And, you know, the black, you can see the blue is pumping the water out from outside. And mm-hmm. and so they, they're using trash cans to get the water out, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yep. Uh, to, yeah, to get the water basically to where the pumps were running. Uh, you, you use what you got. So, because... I don't have anything else. <laughs> the, so what were you thinking uh, in capturing? Because the guy that we're focused on here, the expression on his face seems like yeah. a mixture of uh, a little bit of exhaustion, a little bit of introspection, maybe a couple of other yeah. things that you you could delve into the more you look at the photo. <laughs> but what, yeah. what, what made you interested in his expression? Yeah, certainly he was feeling whatever he was feeling in the moment, uh, you know, being overwhelmed, the anxiety, the stress, um, you know, we, I think his face kind of tells the story, uh, helps put the viewer kind of in his boots in that moment and kind of invoke the senses, I guess, in a more profound way, um, without kind of, I guess, that physical gesture, the hand on the forehead, certainly. Right. I mean, oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's very, just very, very, a uh, nice little elegant, addition to it and the the people in the background yeah. are interesting to me too because you have this guy on stage has a very dutiful expression just trying to get things done mm-hmm. the guy in the green shirt looks like he's almost having fun like he's just you know he's, he's yeah. he has a very positive attitude you can tell yeah well he in his case he's obviously seen the end of this right because he's been here two or three days now i mean when i went back to the synagogue multiple times like he was the one guy i saw every single time there mm. um he just on the clock um so he probably was seeing the light at the end of the tunnel finally um yeah. you know the, the one challenge i ran into 
and photographing this was like, and I don't know if this is maybe a Jewish thing or not, but like, you know, people who have been through a lot worse than a flood, you know, I'm thinking of Holocaust survivors or whatever, like perspective than people who don't have that life experience. And it's like, I was trying to capture these very emotional scenes with all this devastation, but then like people were smiling and like, I don't know, <laughs> looking happy. And it was just this weird disjuncture between the, the airs that they were trying to put on. Like, yes, we've been through hell, but we're still strong and we're going to be optimistic. And yet obviously the scene is in total devastation. So mm-hmm. well, and, um, and what I, <laughs> what I've observed in religious communities and for, for me, it would be the, the, the Christian community for you. It would be the Jewish community. Uh, I also live in Utah. So I spend a lot of time with, we have some Mormon friends here as well. Yeah. And, there tends to be this common thread of a tremendous focus on family. And when you focus on the yep. fact that, that all of your family members are still hanging around or, you know, God forbid you lose one, but you still have a lot of other ones in a situation like this. Uh, you, you learn, you learn to be grateful when, when you look at the world Absolutely. that way. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting. You mentioned Mormons. Um, so there's been a flood, no pun intended, um, of like volunteers that come in and help with all this disaster recovery. And I got to tell you, the Mormon church is unbelievable. They have sent some of the most experienced, hardworking volunteers on multiple occasions from after multiple floods in Houston that have really done a lot of the nasty, horrible labor. And they do it with a smile and they do it because they're doing God's work. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing again, oh, yeah. again, you know, they're, they're values driven people. Yeah. I, I, it's so impressive. And, you know, you go through an experience like this and some people may ask, well, where is God? Why would God let this happen? You know, I kind of see the opposite. I see God at work through all these people coming in to clean up, you know? Uh, so it's kind of an, ins- an inspiring thing. Absolutely. It, it's, it's almost like you, you, you can find, sometimes you can find more of God in the, the effort to fix the problem. It's like he threw, yep. he threw something at you and said, here, you, you have to figure this out now. And then you come together. It's like, it's like a fantastic, uh, uh Tyler Perry movie or something of this sort, if you will. <laughs> I agree. Where you come out in the end and yeah, everybody's and closer that, together. That... You mended a relationship. <laughs> you got mom speaking to daughters. Now the daughter's not into drugs anymore. Well, and it's a great point because a lot of the folks that I interview to do these stories, you know, one of the things that they will say repeatedly is that, you know, God doesn't give us, don't have the ability to overcome, Mm -hmm. you know, so, and thank God people are overcoming. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an attitude. It's, it's an, oh (laughs) oh my gosh, I almost, I almost went super I should be a rapper. I almost said it's an attitude and a gratitude, but I held back on that one because that was just <laughs> way too nice. over the top. I got cringy. <laughs> All right, we're going to move to the next photo. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> uh, this, this next one uh, sort of doubles up on the expression side of things. You have a woman looking into a dresser, and uh, she has her hand over her chest, and she looks she looks a little bit um, emotionally, uh, not startled, but... The so, a strong emotional reaction to something going on in front of her. So, what was happening there? Yeah. So this this family actually had only been in Houston for about a month, um, and probably had just finished unpacking. Um, and uh, so they're in the daughter one of the daughter's rooms here, and the mother is basically salvaging, you know, whatever little property that they had left for the children. Um, kind of stick up high on the dresser as the water was kind of coming in. So she's got the trash bag and is basically pulling out whatever is safe to pull out at this point. Uh, And obviously is, you know, very emotional and having to do this, you know, you can kind of see the bed frame in the back bottom right corner there. Um, So anything that was, I guess, below four or five feet, was totally gone. Mm. Um, and yeah, you, a lot of these people walked away with, 
you know, a couple trash bags of uh, personal items, and that was basically it. You know, that was all that was left. Well, I think what's important about this photo, and you captured it beautifully, uh, is that you're looking <laughs> at somebody who who you can relate to, somebody who is either, you know, your mom or your sister or or people that you run into in your life that are just sort of salt of the earth types of people. And you're like, and you're able to relate with whatever they're going through at that moment. And I, I think that that is something that is much needed right now in the world of news and storytelling. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a family. I think they got four or five children, you know, all under the age of uh, hardworking parents and, uh, you know, parents want to be able to provide for their kids. And, uh, this was a situation that took away a lot of that hard earned, uh, stuff yeah. that parents, you know, labor. So yeah. give to their children and, uh, it's really hard. And again, like she's putting things in the bag, but for me, that's not the photo, right? The photo is her reaction to having to put things in the bag. So, mm. The hand on the heart there, I think, tells a much better story than if she was, you know, dropping something into the bag itself. <clears throat> mm -hmm, absolutely. So. I, I think that the uh, more dramatic experiences like this are a great teacher for people who are trying to be photographers and specifically people who would try to lean more into the documentary photography realm of things to t you, you can take. Uh, very intense experiences that have been captured and apply them to your less intense experiences and look for look for emotional responses like the, this even though they're they're much less pronounced on a you know on a daily basis but uh, this inspires me to look for stories like this and, and be able to capture expressions because I think these are meaningful I, I think they, yeah. they do actually affect you on a, a visceral level I hope so. And, you know, and these are just micro gestures, right? Like she probably has her hand on her heart for a half a second. Yeah. Uh, you just got to be able to read a situation as a photographer. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a crappy job too. like, you hear these, this family has just lost everything. <laughs> and here comes the photographer knocking on the door saying, Hey, can I come in and take pictures of you throwing away everything your entire life? And then ask yeah. you questions. And how do you feel about having to throw all your daughter's clothes away? Let's like, talk about it. If you would cry, it's... that would be helpful for the photo. <laughs> I'd hate to make you cry, but if you do, I'd like to be there to capture it. Yes. It's such a horrible job. Uh, <laughs> I can't like, I can't, I mean, I'm, but it's really the truth. It it really is crummy. Um, well, and you have to you, know, you have to fight we, some stereotypes that photographers <laughs> can incur. I would assume in that sort of situation. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Like you got to be compassionate, uh, and you know that's the hardest part, though, is knocking on the door of somebody like this, saying, you know, hey, let me into your life here at the lowest point. <laughs> sure. And uh, let me take pictures to show everybody. Uh, <laughs> it's quite exploitative. And, you know, I guess you tell yourself that hopefully this does some good, right? People see the story. They want to come and volunteer or go donate or mm. a city official decide to improve flooding, you know, your flood district. Or at some point it helps somebody, but like... In the moment, it is really hard to reconcile because you, you don't have, uh, you don't have the, you know, response yet to the article or to the photograph. Because well, it's not like you're important. you're showing up with a check and you're saying everything that right. you just lost. Here's here's money. Go to Target, fix it. Yeah, right. You're just it's it's exactly. less immediate, but you have to you have to remember that you're doing something that is meaningful and that it, that lasts. Because I mean, this is a photo that lasts until until all the hard drives die. I mean, this is a photo that's going to be around. <laughs> it has it has an emotional yeah. And, and you know, I mean, these are the area that I was shooting in here. These are middle class families, and I don't think the middle class. You know, I think they have a a higher expectation of privacy than you know people who unfortunately seem to make the news cycle more often because of you know being on a lower socioeconomic level or higher crime rate areas or they 
live in a part of town that, you know, doesn't have good public utilities. And so unfortunately, like they're just expected to be able to be completely exposed to the media. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And specs not as strong. It, it is like I think harder to do this in kind of you know these middle class parts of town. I, I don't think it's right, but I think that is kind of the reality, unfortunately. Sure, sure. <clears throat> okay, next photo. It'll load. All right, we have the uh, two boys pushing a cart of books down the hallway. Looks like they're being part of the cleanup effort. All the grounds yep. are concrete at this point. I assume that all the flooring has been torn out. <laughs> Yeah, this I can't remember. This may have been a linoleum floor to begin with, but mm. you can kind of see the residue of the puddles. But yeah, you know, just teams of volunteers. I mean, these were books that look like they may have been saved, but obviously the rest of the building is pretty stripped bare. This was a school. This was actually a Montessori preschool. Um, some of these kids actually have, were former students, which was kind of cool uh, that they still feel connected enough to the school that, you know, a decade or so later they come back to kind of help clean it up um so uh, you know you know one really meaningful thing that i think your photos do here is it makes me want to find a place to be that if i need to be that and it reminds me how important it is to be there for a community uh and and that that's what i love about art in general is it has the ability to do that without telling you, you need to go, you need to go serve somewhere. You need to go fix something. It says, it it shows you a situation and says, what are you going to do about this? Thanks. So, you know, I, I really appreciate that because I think one of the overall overarching messages that I try to convey in this reportage is like, yeah, it's valuable to belong to a community because when you need help, like, your community is going to be there for you, you know? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Very good. So I appreciate that observation. Yeah, no, you, you did it well. I mean, that's what, that's, what's meaningful about these photos to me. Okay. So Thanks. next photo, we have a woman sitting on the ground. She has a mask on, I assume from uh, trying not to get sick in some sort. Yep. She's sorting out a bunch of photos that look like they may have been waterlogged on the ground. Yeah, and I, I think of all the possessions or stuff um, that people lost in the flood, re- the hardest to accept are, like, the family photographs. So obviously, I have my own personal story now to share with my grandmother's house and her, her photos. But, yeah, I mean, these things are the memories and the records that we have that go back generations. And so a lot of effort is put into trying to save what can be saved. And, um, you know, so here, yeah, you have, you have that effort kind of unfolding. Um, and there's a lot more to do in this house, obviously, but the photos were definitely given priority, but you can kind of run your eye across the scene. I mean, the photos are being put on a tarp, floor is now concrete behind you can see the sheetrock on that blue wall there you basically sheetrock comes like new sheetrock comes in four foot sections so mm-hmm. even if you only got four inches of flood water in your house you're still gonna have to cut up four feet because you it's much easier to replace a whole section rather than having to cut it up smaller so oh interesting um, yeah uh but this house did get i think about two and a half feet um and yeah it's it Again, the photos are really hard to see destroyed because people really, really uh, treasure these. And, you know, it certainly hopefully has affected people's behavior after these floods, like to put family photos, you know, in watertight bins, but also not on the bottom of closets, but on the top of the closet <laughs> shelf, you know, so that's protected. And, <clears throat> or on carbonite.com or something of that sort. Yeah, right. Exactly. I would like to see, you know, what films, what film scanner sell sales were after Harvey, because all the people are trying now to digitize things uh, in the event that the originals oh, yeah. are lost. But... Oh, man, that was the market then. Yeah. Uh, so there are, yeah. there are a couple of things I find really interesting about this photo. I think it demonstrates, it's, first of all, <laughs> once again, captured very beautifully. I think it demonstrates the priorities we have as humans. It show, the background is, is tattered and they're drawn doors out and things you know sort of falling apart the walls half missing but she's very elegantly placing photos in 
a nice little grid trying to organize things and it shows how how important memories are to us and how important yeah. the, ca- these these captured memories are to us and also i love the expression of her hand just placing one down the other. she has one in one hand and then uh the, her right hand she's pl- she's placing the next one down so it's a sense of motion you see where she's going she's continuing her project i think you captured that well well, thank you. And this particular situation was a really tough one. Um, so this house has now flooded three times in three years. Uh, on the 2015 flood, um, the homeowner's eldest daughter, it was on the night of their high school graduation. They uh, were downtown for the graduation ceremony. The grandparents were in one car. The parents and the daughter were in another. The flood, the Rain started coming down pretty good, so the grandparents left to try to beat the rain home, and the parents ended up getting stuck in the parking garage downtown. Meanwhile, the par- the grandparents got to their house because uh, the family was going to just be reunited there, but didn't have the keys and were locked out, um, and so stayed in the driveway in their car until the water came all the way up to the car and they called the fire department. The fire department came in a rescue boat, put the grandparents in life jackets, um, and about a mile away, the boat stalled and then capsized because of the rushing waters, and the grandparents actually drowned and died. Wow. Um, this was this was Harvey? This was no. This was the 2015 Memorial Day flood. Oh, I see. Um, wow. But this family, this family now has flooded two more times since then. Um, and actually, the family is now living in the house of the grandparents because um, that house thankfully did not flood, and they needed a place to go. So that's where they're living now, and they're selling the house that has now flooded three times. So this po- this poor family is just. That's awful. Been put through the ringer. Yeah, it's it's really horrible. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no, no. The, I mean, that's it's it's important to understand how dangerous these things are. You look at it from the outside, and you don't really see, yeah. you don't really grasp the the way that floods work if you don't live in an area that floods often. But it right. it's easier than you think. I think to end up in a really yeah. really bad situation. Man, yeah, that's tough. Okay, next photo. Find, let's find a happy story, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. This guy's alive. All uh, right. He's alive. Uh, it looks like it was a children's room based on the uh, the painting on the wall there. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so. He's pull, the pulling off now... the baseboards from the wall exactly. probably to replace yeah. them. Yep. And this guy was part of an organization. It's called Nahama, which is a Jewish disaster recovery organization. You don't have to be Jewish to volunteer for it. Um, in fact, most of the volunteers I don't think are Jewish, but um, they, you know, deploy volunteer crews to come in and help pull out. And so, yeah, this is one of their volunteers basically removing the, uh, the damaged woodwork and then they're going to cut the drywall out right after this. But, you know, oppositionally, I was trying to, do something a little more interesting. The room was obviously pretty empty and bare. So, no, compositionally is a very interesting photo, and I, I, I'm interested. And in, in, tell me how you did this. I think it's interesting how he is seemingly looking at the camera. I guess he's probably just <coughs> looking down at his project and what he's doing. But his expression's interesting because it almost looks like he's locking eyes with you. Yeah. Uh... So I try, again, if we want an emotional connection between the viewer of a photograph and the subject matter, like I think, you know, I, the connection is really important. Lower angle put me on his, you know, line of sight, his vision, because he was, you know, paying attention to the board that was being pulled up. So by putting the camera kind of down on that, that, that level, I was hoping to obviously get a, a stronger connection between yeah. I mean, the people that were going to image in the story. So, I think I think the way that you use composition here allowed this photo to be very compelling and engaging, right? So if you're scrolling past this, as that that is how we engage photos nowadays. If you're scrolling down, you see this, and you go, "Ooh, what's this about? This is this is different than this is different than the the photo before this of uh, you know some sort of selfie, and then the photo after this of 
uh, another selfie because that person posted two selfies in a row for some reason. Uh, <laughs> did you know that I, I learned that, I don't know if this is an actual statistic, but I heard that girls tend to take an average of like 50 selfies before they find the right one and share it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least they're like editing their work, right? Oh, and yeah. I'm just going to go with the first one. I give them credit for that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, they're, they're, they're after quality and, you know, they, they really refine <laughs> the posture. It's, it's absolutely uh, elegant and, and positioned with intense specificity. I love it because, you know, the selfie, uh, you know, has the snapshot sort of aesthetic to it. But in fact, if people are spending more time and being more intentional with their selfies, then that's fantastic. It'll hopefully improve the quality of selfies. <laughs> Emotional connection. And I mean, obviously, you here have a very compelling uh, selfie game with this first photo we looked at. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So <laughs> You got to get closer, though. I mean, you're on a ladder. You're like you're like 30 feet yeah. away. Yeah, I know. We're gonna work this. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta get closer and then point it down at you from as high as possible. And then do the duck lips. So although yeah, you couldn't yeah. see that the uh the respirator mask, I guess. Exactly. Time, so. Exactly. And it, it takes away the it takes away it makes you look slimmer. It's slimming. <laughs> All right. Make I sure definitely I think I lost ten ten pounds or more uh from during the flood. So Oh yeah. Just running around? Running around, not eating, not staying hydrated, working mm. you know, around the clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, next photo we have a we have a couple of uh, looks like Penske trucks. I think that's what those are. And they have supplies in the back. You got a fellow uh, yep. in the distance uh, looking at the supplies, figuring out what he's going to do. You got the fellow close to you looking at the camera. Interestingly enough, I, well, first off, I like the expression of his hand holding onto the handle of the truck. He's got a nice little smile on his face. Looks like a positive guy, mm. but he's missing a leg. He has only one leg and a yeah. prosthetic. Yeah, so that's obviously what made this particular Red Cross uh, worker stand out um, from the crowd that happened to be there at this supply depot, you know, getting people what they needed in the aftermath of the flood. And uh, obviously a guy who's lost a lot in his own personal life, but, you know, has dedicated his life to helping people who also have lost a lot so i, I love that was, juxtaposition that's fantastic yeah and it turns out he was a veteran and you know he had a really impressive kind of personal story oh, and man. the fact that his life is dedicated to giving back is uh was just remarkable so he was any guy to kind of feature in this particular storyline you know Michael, do you ever just look at other people and go what am i doing with my life yeah, I feel totally like not worthy <laughs> of being called a human being when other people really are amazing individuals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So here's another photo of the hamster tubing <coughs> as soon as it loads. Hamster tubing running through. It uh, looks like a school. Is this a school? Uh, synagogue. So this is that first synagogue, the oh, largest one in Houston. Yeah. Beautiful uh, building. And, and, yeah, it really is special, um, and it's historic. It's like one of the first. So, in a uh, let's see, an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright um, was the architect that designed this building. So, it does have significance, mm. historic history of architecture. But, but um, you know, I'm not a good landscape photographer. I don't do it often enough. But this was an occasion where I certainly kind of was put in the position to try to learn. <laughs> well, no, this is uh, this is a good example of uh, of sort of tie, uh, tying using images like this to tie a story together. Where this wouldn't be sort of the main image. This would be something that you could use uh, as an extension of the story. But it's funny because you you have this really dramatic angle looking up at the skylight, interesting lighting coming in. And then you see this alien tentacle coming through <laughs> a, a building. Yeah. It's very start yeah, and, startling. In this, you know, the skylight was obviously the most important feature rather than the tubing because, you know, we, we look for the rainbow after the storm, right? <laughs> right? So the fact that the sun was coming out, like I was trying to convey some optimism mm -hmm. with the fact that the air is now being dried out in this building and it's a wreck, but you know, hopefully we're going moving in a better direction. So, yeah. 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 I, you know, I think it's hard to tell a story with a landscape. Like that's why I'm so impressed with like quality landscape photographers because I think people are, 
it's more dummy photography, right? Because it's easier to tell a story that way. But yeah, uh, no, it's it's. Uh, I I absolutely agree, and I find myself. I'll go out into landscapes, and I, and I go. I'll get out there and I'll go. I have to find a person. Like I can't just take some trees and make it into right. something that I feel good about. A story, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but there. I mean, there. There. I'm working on a video right now. It's going to come out soon. That is about my top uh, three favorite. Well. It's going to be sort of the top three best uh, travel photographers. It's really just a list of my top three favorite travel photographers on Instagram. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, their ability to just just to take a landscape and give it personality and bring it bring it alive in an interesting yeah, way. Tell right, tell a story. I mean, in this case, obviously, the sun was the character of my story. So, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's like where you get rid of the element of the spontaneity of having a person in the frame and working with that person. You have to fill that in with really intentional, thoughtful composition and trying to find a story in nature. You understand the space, right? And the, the relationship the space has to, to the context and everything. Say, say that again because you cut Only out a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, like trying to find what the rela- – understanding the space that you're in and then what the relationship that space has to the context and the story. Like it makes you definitely work harder yeah. um, to, to get a good photo out of that, you know. Yeah, and I, <laughs> I, I actually think it's – I'm thinking of this for the first time now, but it's probably interesting for somebody like us to go out and try to take some landscape photos to work on our compositional uh, skills. It- <laughs> It makes you better, that's for sure, but it will frustrate the hell out of you, at least oh, in my yeah. experience. Because, <laughs> oh, again, yeah. I, like I like dummy photography. I like the easy stuff. People people make it easy when they're in the shot. <laughs> right, right. Okay, next we have a photo. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, as soon as it'll load. Uh, and then I, I might skip forward a little bit so we can whip through a couple of these faster. Yeah, but uh, but so. we, we, can, uh, we can talk about this one really quick. So same idea. We have a girl sitting on the floor of – synagogue uh organizing some photos laid out in the yeah. background we have are those uh are those uh torahs that's what that's what yes yeah, so those are prayer books okay that are wet, they're drawing and these were um these were like class photographs of like the confirmation class and you know basically the synagogue's records going back 80 years uh and this is actually a rabbi that's there she was just hired she was a young rabbi like in her 20s and like <laughs> one of her first jobs was basically going through the entire history of the synagogue and trying to save <laughs> we could call that an immersive learning experience yeah you know she probably got the job that she did an interview for but this is really <laughs> this is what she's doing. um yeah she's a neat lady her name is sarah fort rabbi sarah fort mm. and that synagogue is lucky to have her because she put some serious hours in there yeah 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 thanks sarah <clears throat> yep she's right. awesome i'm gonna move forward a couple find some uh sure. some interesting ones here okay so this one's this one's we're getting into a little bit more of uh the rescue efforts again we have a firefighter sitting on the front of a fire truck looking at a house that's burning looks like he's been working hard semi exhausted uh what was going on here yeah so uh you know you got the fire then or you got the flood and then you get the fire um mm. what happened was you know houses have flooded and lost electricity in the storm when the electricity was restored and you had certain appliances like refrigerators or even you know electrical panel that was compromised because it got wet. As soon as the power came back on and those compressors kicked on, like you had a fire hazard. Yeah, so bad day. In multiple cases, houses that flooded uh, soon after actually caught fire and burned down um, because people didn't, you know, unplug things or weren't able to get back to the house fast enough to unplug things or whatever and so yeah the fire department those men and women man they just they were working serious serious hours and shifts trying to deal with this situation yeah so, i mean because they're at this point they're firefighters and flood fighters at the same time just, yeah 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 i mean it's amazing like we run away from these disasters these men and women run toward them and uh you know we talk about heroes these are these are the heroes for sure um and so yeah this was a situation obviously you this house was burning this guy had been inside and you know they they're not allowed to be in there for very long they they basically run shifts um and so he was of his shift and you yeah, know yeah. kind of watching things from afar yeah 
This is why I love taking photos of emergency workers because I have such tremendous respect <coughs> for them. And I think we don't talk about that enough as a as a community, as a nation, whatever metric you want to put it. Like I think we just don't I think we respect them, but we don't talk about how important they are to keeping everything functioning. I absolutely agree with you and just the uh you know, this tremendous sacrifice these people you know, make for the rest of us, you know? Yep. 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 Um, okay. So we'll look at another one. I think it's from the same house situation. So got a guy, pat yeah. one firefighter patting another firefighter <clears throat> on the arm. He's got a, a, a positive expression on his face. Looks absolutely dirty, uh, from whatever <laughs> yeah, he's been up to in there, the house behind him, all these firefighters kind of doing their thing. Everybody just looks exhausted. man. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a emotional scene. I liked all the ink on that one guy's arm. Obviously, they kind of oh yeah, tattoos and such. Visual interest to it. And a lot of these guys are veterans too, so they all have these amazing stories on how they, you know, joined the fire department mm-hmm. to begin with. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah. So he was just he was. They were having a lovely conversation about how they're going to go get beers after this. Probably. Uh, I hope so. I hope they got to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they deserve <laughs> it at this point, right? Funny. Yep. Okay, let's, let's move forward a little bit. All right, we'll do sure. this. We're getting into a couple that I really like. That I, one of them actually made me laugh. Uh, but let's see. Here's one. Okay, what? So what's going on here? We have uh, some tennis courts, and uh, it looks like they're organizing some p- supplies, like a makeshift yep. recovery center, if you will. Lots of people standing around. Yeah. So uh, in Southwest Houston, the Jewish Community Center, which is like a YMCA. Um, even though it flooded, in fact, its entire basement took in like 10 feet of water. Uh, its school got flooded. They uh, they decided that they were still going to do everything possibly could to help the neighborhood out. And so they converted their indoor tennis court to this massive first aid and supply site where you know, people who could purchase supplies or companies that were donating supplies could drop that stuff off. And then anybody who needed anything could come in and uh, and pick up what they needed. Everything from medical supplies to new clothes, cleaning supplies. I mean, you name it, boxes, packing stuff. like. And then there were FEMA people there and Red Cross workers doing all this intake. And um, Fortunately, there was like a uh, an upstairs kind of like cafe area, uh, so I was able to go up there and kind of shoot, you know, down. This was the last day of the supply uh, system at this place because um, it was, I think, uh, more than a week after the storm at this point, and you know they were trying to kind of get back to normal after that. So yeah. things were winding down. It was a lot less crazy that day than it was before so i was curious uh, how you how you got such a dramatic angle looking down from such a, <laughs> on high yeah. and, and you know trying to use the nets at an angle to create a little more of a dynamic composition and again like landscape landscape type photos i think make you work a little harder so you're kind of mm-hmm. paying attention to those things you know well not not to mention i don't know if you you feel the same tenseness but whenever i'm shooting a scene like this i'm trying to get everybody in the scene to do exactly what i want them to do at all times which <laughs> yeah, is really it's hard a lot of control here <laughs> yeah like you, you you got like you go back and you're like ah oh, crap that person's head's popping out of somebody else's head and there's an arm going into a torso and <laughs> yeah sort of in these type of shots too like i wish i could have stood up there for more than two minutes to shoot the perfect photograph i mean you can see there's like people who are cut off on the left side of the frame and whatnot but like the story is happening so fast and you see all these other little stories that are happening down there like yeah you get two shots and then you gotta go run to the next thing because you're afraid to go miss the next thing so you really don't have a whole lot of time to kind of work the scene like you normally would it's like it's like Uh, fortunately you know go ahead yeah i said fortunately you know i shoot enough street photography so like during fleeting moments uh and so i think that has helped actually with my photojournalism a lot that's funny uh, me and will were uh me and my you know uh will who was on my last video yep. before he we me and him were talking about how street photography helps and it's funny you mentioned that because he was saying that he he, he does a lot of portrait work so uh really mm-hmm. he, he he ends up in situations where he can control the variables 
a little bit more and uh, also does environmental portraits. But even then, you're you're going into a situation where you have some time with somebody and to kind of figure out how you're going to um, dynamically place them within the the framing and and get the light just right and this and that. He he, we spoke about how helpful it is to um, be a street photographer. And yeah. when, when you have when you have a, a quarter of a second to make a shot work, when you take that into a situation like this, it's just a, I mean, especially like what what we're looking at here is just an extension of what you already do on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah, if you want to be a photojournalist, I'd say if you want to get a photojournalism, start with street photography because it yeah. will hone your skills, man. Yeah, and when you when you go into a situation like this, where like when you're on the street, you're <coughs> looking for stories at all times, and that can be one of the most yeah. frustrating parts about shooting. When you end up in a situation like this, this is a situation where the story has has been provided for you, and you only need to yeah. figure out how to execute on that. And, uh, and, and without street photography, I would say you're a little less prepared for something like this. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, but you know, the opposite, like the opposite is true here too, like from a street scene where you're kind of patiently waiting for something to evolve and happen in this situation, like there's a million stories all happening at the same time. And so like prioritizing which one and how much time you're going to spend <laughs> it's on overload. A versus yeah, yeah. B, like, yeah, it's like the opposite at the same time, but it's still roughly the same skill set, right? It's all about knowing how to get what you want as quick as possible and Absolutely. as cleanly as possible and then move on because <laughs> <Absolutely. laughs> you got to. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so I, I wanted to make sure to get this one in because this is your lovely grandmother. Looks like she's sorting is, out some yeah. things. Uh, she's, yep. she, it's, it's interesting to me that the sort of feeble efforts that one goes into when they're trying, when they're in a situation like this, where you're, you don't want the wind to pick up the pictures that are sitting on these tables organized in a grid. So you put rocks on them. Yeah. We were, we were waiting for the next delivery of clothespins. My stepfather, went, I think went out to like six different uh, dollar stores to buy all the clothespins. So, uh, we needed to get these things, you know, out of the water some of them had been in the, you know, this re, when we resubmerged them for multiple hours. And so, yeah, we basically resulted in having to open up some card tables and uh, put them down with stones until we got the next delivery of clothespins and then we hung them up. Mm -hmm. um, not the best thing in the world. It, it worked and we saved a lot more prints as a result uh, mm -hmm. bes besides just the negative. So, but yeah, you can see my grandmother kind of reliving the history again she's 93 here almost 94 you can see all her possessions in the background and that's what i was gonna uh, i was gonna mention is her age and the fact that she's i mean she's going at it she's getting work done she's not messing oh, yeah. around she, no she wasn't waiting for the red cross to like come and help her out like she was there with her with the rest of the family and volunteers working as hard in fact she probably put more hours in than anybody did at, oh, yeah. over at her house so oh man old people know how to work <clears throat> yeah <laughs> they do they went they went through uh <laughs> the the remnants of the depression and everything they're they're exactly. <laughs> they have an ethic he's he's seen worse yeah or better or worse okay so this one this next one is uh, this photo made me laugh uh, <laughs> we have a yeah here we have a shot of a police officer lady uh with her car in the background <laughs> half submerged in water that's gonna be a really bad situation it's hilarious to me that well for one she's making this face at the camera like well that's that's that car's gone like she's like whatever and then she's holding her coffee in one hand her phone in the other hand it's just like <laughs> another day on the job yeah, and again, obviously the story here is like sometimes the rescuers have to be rescued themselves. Yeah. So yeah, she was on an emergency call trying to get to somebody that needed help, and her cruiser uh, got stuck and with wow. the rising water, and uh, some neighbors helped her out and gave her a hot cup of coffee and a phone to call her colleagues to pick her up, which she was there for like nine hours because nobody could get to her. Um, 
But uh, yeah, she still looks pretty good. I mean, given the situation and obviously having a sent the humor about it. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's 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 it shows a, it shows how much you have to have a sense of humor in a situation like this. Totally, and um, you know, moments later, we were. I got a crappy photograph of it. I don't know if you have it in this collection or not because it was. It's hard to tell what it was, but um, when I, I was actually this kind of one. in this area. Okay, yeah, so that wasn't the one, but that's obviously the same for police officer. So what happened was I waited across this, the street to basically keep going on with the story, but then obviously uh, this was a great photograph that I had to get mm-hmm. um, just with the neighbors, and that helped her out. But then I turned around, and uh, I see this like kind of large object moving around at my feet, and it was actually a dead body. Um, no way. Yeah, and I only had my my ninety millimeter lens on me. Um, so my other camera had actually gotten wet, so oh, I was wow. only shooting with a with a short telly there. So oh, I, I know I know what photo you're talking about. I'm gonna have to actually find that because now okay, that, yeah, now... you can kind of the the man's clothes had basically been pulled off of him. He's you can see his white underwear and like some yeah. part of his legs, but you know he was at my ankles, so like. Unfortunately, it was too tight of a shot to really kind of tell what it was. But um, yeah, because it's so funny. Yeah. I was looking at that and I was looking through the photos and, I, you know, I look at all of these details very closely and I was I was I couldn't quite figure out. I couldn't quite make out what it was. Uh, yeah. But let me find probably, that. Probably like what it would have been one of the best, sto- like not best, but like important stories to like report on. Like I got the crappiest photo for, yeah. unfortunately, just because my equipment <laughs> let me down. But yeah. Let me go to that Dropbox uh, link you sent me. Just to, <coughs> and give an idea really quick. I think this is yeah. So that was tough. And and I mentioned earlier that my friends' parents are the ones who drowned. So I'm like only a block and a half away from their house. It's very possible that that would have been the dad because what happened was uh, the body was there. The current was still moving pretty good, and you know I tried grabbing a hold of it um of him and i was knocked over and then it was either like get pulled into it myself there it is um or let it uh Mm -hmm. do it so unfortunately so yeah so this picture here is let me let me go ahead and open it uh bring it over for the recording so that they can see what's going on here let's see and I only got the one shot because once I realized what it was, there we go. Then I tried to grab Man. him, and you know, it wasn't successful. But yeah, so like on the right side of the frame, you can see the white underwear, and those are his legs, kind of like coming off in the other direction that toward is, the left. I, I, you corner. know, I had this little thought. I was like, I could. I, I, there was a part of me that wondered if maybe. I, I don't know. It was a person or something like that, but I couldn't quite make it out. But you, when you give the context, I mean, that's that's just that's startling, man. Yeah, this one's stay is staying with me. Um, again, one of the worst photos I've taken, but certainly one of the most uh, emotional, personal moments for me, and just the powerlessness of it. Right, like I couldn't. This man's life had already been taken. But right, you couldn't do anything I, about it. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I couldn't even get him out of the water. Unfortunately, um, now my friend's parents who drowned uh, the the dad. No, the grandfather was, he was actually pulled out of a tree like several miles away mm-hmm. a couple of days later. Um, and I think this could have been him. I mean, it would make sense geographically at least. Um, Cause he was, there was only, there was a couple of people who drowned in that area and, and he was definitely, you know, yeah. one of the few older ones there. So anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's like uh, a, lot, a lot of people would not, would maybe avoid taking this photo, but it, I think it shows a sense of, I, I would take this photo because I, I see tremendous value in capturing even the, the darker parts of life. I think that we have to yeah. continue to do that. But, you know, we talked a second ago about just how quick, you know, the stories were unfolding. So one minute I was taking these pictures of this police officer who was basically trying to make light of her situation. And then like a moment later, like literally a turnaround and then I encounter a person who drowned, yeah. you know, like yeah. that was kind of, that's what it was like <laughs> being yeah. out there. Yep. <laughs> All right. So let's go, uh, let's go back. 
You're supposed yep. to tell me happy stories, Michael. <laughs> okay, we can go back to the Goodness. police officer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. So I'm going to move down. <laughs> I'm going to look at uh, this one really quick, and then we'll move to the last one. But I really okay, like sure. I like the composition of this one. Let me make sure that they can see what's yeah, going on. Yeah, so. yeah, so this was another, another house fire. Uh, mm-hmm. Same day, though. Again, I think there were three three emergency called in the Myerland area that day for house fires. And, you know, this was well after the situation had calmed down. And, mm-hmm. you know, again, like there's the photos that are great, like in the, at the APEC moment, but I really like kind of the meta, the meta photos, things that have just happened, like the emotional response to whatever the person has just gone through. And yeah. So here you have, uh, you know, this firefighter coming off the boom. Yeah, he's walking, um, walk, after, walking down the ladder, and uh, you caught him in an interesting point in his stride, and you could see a little bit of his facial expression. But yeah, point, point. But and, I like, uh, I really like the angle. I think it's a, it's a well composed photo. <laughs> Thanks. I, I work hard at trying to do vertical. Most of my photography is horizontal, and I suck at vertical. So like, I'm <laughs> trying really hard here to, you know, grow my catalog. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the last one I wanted to look at. You got to tell me about this one. Uh, this is a man sleeping on a counter with water up to the counter. It looks like yes. the edge of a port, and he looks like he's made this counter into his bed. Uh, what's so, going yeah, on here? The Most of my photos that we've seen up here have been shot with real cameras, um, but I generally one of my – and this is that one. This was the house that I dropped the camera into the water at. Start up, start um, over really quick because you cut out. Okay, sorry. So, um, I was this was the most of the photographs that I've taken were shot with real cameras. This one was with a cell phone. Um, this was actually where I dropped my camera in the water and didn't have my backup on me at the time. Mm-hmm. So when you're out there reporting these stories, you also you just can't help but try to help at the same time and so i was taking pictures interviewing people but also helping rescue them and so this was an elderly man he was actually a double lung transplant uh, patient a few months earlier this is his kitchen countertop um in the house and so high the water has come up in his house over four feet and the family was basically just stranded there for 12 hours it's all the way up to the top of the Um, counter all the way up to the top of the counter and you know uh I, you know i got a couple shots off with my cell phone before i really you know needed to forget uh, being a reporter for a minute and go back to being a human being and get this help get this old man out of this house and in better better situation so mm, yeah i mean i i just <clears throat> I, it's got to be an interesting feeling being in such a raw situation like that where you're like, this man is sleeping on his, ca- or he's laying on his counter right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let me take, he, he let me take a photo. Out. Cause that's what I'm supposed to do. But I like the, but then you have to process that. Right. It's yeah. so bizarre. Yeah. And again, like we talked about kind of the, the, the water quality. I mean, you can see this water is pretty toxic uh, in this particular image. Uh, and again, this is a guy whose immune system is not sharp. He just went through incredibly difficult surgery. He passed out on the countertop and, uh, you know, his wife refused to be rescued before he was. Mm. Um, so he was the first to pulled out of there. Man. And, and uh, yeah, this I was find a group it... of Mormons. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I've, like, I was. So yeah, we were, I was with some Mormon volunteers helping helping people here. This guy brought his airboat in. Um, again, the responders, professional first responders, couldn't get in yet, but some you know citizens who were very uh, very smart and motivated found ways to get into the neighborhood. And so, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was going to say I find it interesting that he just has one leg dipped in the water a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. Excellent yeah, photos. I mean, then, oh, thanks. Uh, I hope, uh, I hope he can do some good at something, you know, yeah. the, with the recovery effort. Yeah. No, I think, I think he captured some amazing, uh, some amazing stuff here. Now I want to, I want to switch over and look at a couple of photos from a couple of other photojournalists that I came across. Awesome. Yeah. Some, some real photojournalism. <laughs> <laughs> Shut your face. Uh, let's see here. I think, uh, yeah, to make sure. I... Okay, there we go. 
All right. Uh, so first off, I, so I came across these photographers through a New York Times article, I believe it was, and uh, just a couple of them that I found had really compelling uh, photography. I just, I would love to hear your thoughts on some of this. Is this Harvey stuff also? This is all Harvey. <clears throat> yeah, this is all Harvey. Okay. So first we're looking at a guy named Andrew Burton, and uh, he has mm-hmm. a gallery on his website called uh, Harvey Aftermath. Here we have a really, really startling <clears throat> picture of a, of a woman yeah. standing up to her knees in water. Her hand is on her face. Looks like she's crying, just dealing with the fact that her neighborhood is underwater. Uh, lots of devastation behind her. She's holding a box of just uh, a couple of things that she probably was able to save. But what, what do you think about this? You know, it's a stunning image. Again, the vulnerability. Uh, the, she's holding everything that she probably has left, you know. Yeah. Uh, and again, the hand on the face, it kind of says it all. Um, and the lighting is also just gorgeous. Right. Very dramatic. Yeah, evening light. Yeah. Which is, you know, creates this difficult uh, situation for the viewer because it's the catastrophic scene, but it's also incredibly beautiful, right, mm-hmm. with the lighting and... That's a, it's a mixture of a uh, it's a mixture of, of chaos and beauty. Yeah. And the expression on her face Divine is it, it's almost like there it's almost like uh it's so dramatic the expression and the hand yep. on her face and her arm it's sort of this like I guess that's what is that a that would be a uh, 90 degree angle what's the angle of her <laughs> not not like the bottom half of her arm it's just it's kind of Close to 90. completely horizontal but it's it's such a dramatic expression yep. that it helps tell the story of what she's got to be feeling yeah and it's right there her elbows are on the horizon line yep. yeah it works visually and obviously how it's mirrored the reflection of the tree yeah yep, yep. so let's see i'll skip through a couple of these oh this one's interesting very blurry shot. Looks like yeah, s- slow exposure of a police officer. I'm gonna guess wading through a hallway that's just half full of water. This flashlight, yeah. incredible light. Stunning. Yeah, I, it's it's such it's a it's incredibly dramatic lighting situation. And I think that when you have photos like this, there's that are so dramatic, and not that they all have to be dramatic, but they're so dramatic like this, it pulls you into the photo and, and engages you in the, with the story of what's going on. I, just, I love that yeah. balance between the art of photography and telling a really dramatic and meaningful story. Yeah, because, you know, in these moments, these very fleeting moments, it's hard to uh, think about composition, yeah. obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's why that's another thing that makes these so spectacular. And this is also why we let things fly when we see these famous war photographers. It's just a blurry mess. But you're like, oh, yep. this person's getting shot at right now. That's a mortar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is a awesome image. Obviously, you got the motion blur, so you can. Yeah, I got guy. Really like you're in the boat. The this is like the boat's moving pretty fast across the water. The guy's yep. looking down. I don't know what he's looking for, but very dramatic sort of crouch yeah. down position on the boat and the, the dramatic motion blur. He likes to drag a shutter a lot. Yeah. And you know, what you don't realize is like just being in these boats, it was a perilous thing because you don't know what, I mean, you're typically going to be floating down streets and everything. You don't know if there are cars or other very large things beneath the surface that you can't see that can easily knock you out of that boat and you become a victim too, you know? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah got on these boats they were i mean the bra- the level of bravery was just astounding mm. and you don't you don't really uh recognize that so much when you watch it on a video you're like oh they're just you know they're no. they're, they're on the boat they're on the lake right <laughs> yeah but uh, it, it was in many cases more dangerous to be in a boat than stuck on a roof on a rooftop you know yeah yeah okay let's see here <clears throat> This one's pretty dramatic because you have a you have a, yeah. a close up per, uh, of a person's face, but he's out of focus. So, he's, <coughs> so you get this really emotional connection with the person in the frame, but he's completely out of focus. In the background, you see these people on a boat uh, making their you know just part of the rescue efforts. Another boat on the other side of the frame, mm-hmm. just trying to figure stuff out. It looks like they look they look like they're just f- figuring everything out. One guy's on a cell phone. Very intense image. Yeah. But uh, compositionally, I mean, again, like he uses subframing, right, to capture the boat scenes, like 
uh, with the negative space. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just, and again, you know, the cowboy hat is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, yeah, I gotta have a little bit of Texas in it, Texas, right? Iconic, you know? Yep, absolutely. You're right. Yeah, I, iconic I even... in the way that, too, like. Go ahead. Like, iconic in the sense that, too, like, Texans. I don't know, we pride ourselves on being very self-reliant and like, we're not going to wait around to be saved. We're going to go save ourselves, you know? So. Absolutely. Oh, that's, that's, that's a whole other story themselves. within the whole, uh, within the whole Texas story that I find so fascinating is people in Texas and where I come from in South Carolina, I think South Carolina is very similar to Texas yeah. in a lot of ways where it's, it's, you got, you have people who have a tremendous personal duty and moral compass to, to get things done and they're not going to sit around and, and let uh, things, you know, go south if they have anything right. to say about it. Yep. Let's see here. Very, very true. We have a guy, uh, herding, he's standing in waist deep water, herding cattle, with a wow. paddle. <laughs> yeah, wow. wow, that's an incredible image. Yeah, yeah, absolutely stunning. It's and it, uh, I think what you get a sense of here, and I didn't look at these enough to really get the sense before, but but you do get a sense of community here and just people who are kind of, you know, you like this guy. You don't know where this guy comes from. He just he's just kind of figuring it out. And one of the problems is dealing with the cattle situation. Yeah, you know and. It, being in Houston is a funny place because it's, you know, the fourth largest city in the country. It's very urban. You can see this is, you know, uh, a suburban, you know, neighborhood. But, yeah, like the next block over could be a cow pasture still or people grazing horses. So sure. the fact that you've got, you know, a stampede of cattle down uh, the street, which is now a river. And the guy is just, it's a great Again, Texas scene, but a fantastic photo. Uh, I'm so envious of these uh, because, you know, I was basically pinned down in only a couple of neighborhoods and I could only operate. And really, I mean, that's my jurisdiction anyway because, you know, we're a community newspaper, so we're reporting on what's happening in our own community. I wish, I wish like, ah, I just want to be everywhere, you know, to yeah. get all these stories. This yeah. guy has got some serious skills. I'm really impressed. <laughs> when I... I... It's interesting to me also how he really got in there. Like he's in the water right behind this oh, guy. Oh yeah, he is in the water, right, or in the boat, or he, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you you do risk things um, trying to get your stories for sure. Absolutely, and you see these people who, uh, and it, it reminds me of this because he has an Occupy Wall Street collection too. But uh, you you see these people at protests, for example, they just get right in the middle of the street, I and mean, you know, there's oh, yeah. there's a uh, Roman candles and flash bangs flying right past their head. Yeah, and, but they have to get the photo. I mean, the good and the good photojournalists are not the guys out there with the two hundred millimeter lenses. You know, I mean, I have a ninety, and that's the longest lens I own. And I shoot most of them with a five or with a thirty five or a twenty four. So yeah, yeah, yeah. There, if you want to convey close proximity to the story, you have to physically have close proximity to the story when you're <laughs> right. taking this picture. Yeah, it's a well, it's a it's a means of making the photo more personal, right? <clears throat> Well, yeah, I mean, again, that's, uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, and in, in my case, I write about people I actually know on a regular basis and take pictures of people I actually know. It's not strangers mm-hmm. who you may never see again. Mm-hmm. So this but, one, uh, I, I want I wow. to stop and talk about this one because this is very dramatic. Yeah. It looks like we have a <clears throat> couple of people in a hospital setting, a couple of older people. You have the subframing of of uh, the doctor's arm out of focus and then in the background you have uh, these two uh, elderly ladies who are being treated um, obviously but you know i assume they've been pulled out of their house which is now underwater and it just shows the fragility of everything in these situations absolutely yeah and who are the most vulnerable um when these disasters happen right? definitely but it's a remarkable image it's when you're young and you can move around you, you don't tend to think about <laughs> You don't tend to think about how detrimental it can be to people in the community, and they matter, right? Yeah. So absolutely, inc- but incredible. For, I mean, the framing is great. Oh, it's, it's an example of presence of mind in the midst of a pretty dramatic situation. Absolutely, this is fantastic. Let's see here. Let's skip through a couple of these. Oh wow! The boy with his shirt off, leaning into. I guess that's his dad's like he, it's uh, unless, kind of adult right yeah yeah and you can't well let's see there's a caption let's see if we can get some information 
All right, well, well, that's a lot. Wayne Daly hugs his son, Ronnie Daly, after making plans for his wife's funeral in Houston, Texas. Wow. We haven't been looking at the captions. Mm. Uh, on September 8th, 2017, Daly's wife, Casey, uh, died from preventable causes during flood flooding after Hurricane Harvey, despite Daly's desperate calls to 911, as well as attempting to flag down both rescue boats and helicopters. By the so it's like even though there's so many efforts, it was just overwhelmed. Yeah, this, the the emergency services were completely overwhelmed. Hospitals were overwhelmed. I mean, we were in hospitals where you know patients were. You can even walk in the hospital because the patients were so many were out in the hallway. It was it was wild. Yeah, <clears throat> what a tragic story. Yeah, um, and you don't get you know it's funny you don't you, you I didn't get the sense of that. I didn't realize how many people actually died in in this. I, I think that maybe it was not that it was underreported. It, actually, but it, it wasn't reported in the in, in in a way that gave a sense of that uh, scale of things. You thought yeah, it was just thing, a couple I mean, of people who drove their worked. car into a flood. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So like, all of a sudden, you don't feel so sympathetic toward them. But yeah, I mean, the, the remarkable thing though really is how few fatalities there were. Mm. Um, scenario, at least. I mean, it was. A, it was a few dozen, I believe, under 50, if I'm not mistaken, which, again, is just incredible that more people, the dire circumstances yeah. and the trauma that, you know. Well, it's, it's, sad, it's sad that there are just a select group of people that were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, and yeah, like nobody wants people or for themselves as Harvey survivors or, you know, you were displaced or... But you were never a refugee. You were never a victim. Like people refused to be labeled that way. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, speak to their character, I guess. So this one's really interesting. <clears throat> the back of a Mercedes Benz pointing yep. up in the water. It looks like it's vertical in the water. You, uh, yeah, just well, cresting the, the top the, of the water. The hood is, I think, open. That's why it looks like that because you don't see the Oh, that makes thing. sense. But still, it's it, the hood is all the way open and it's still underwater, right? So Right. Yeah. But, yeah, again, like, so if you're in a boat and you're going over that, you are going to get a rude awakening, right? So, mm-hmm. like, again, it just shows you how dangerous it was, is it was just to be in boats. Yeah, yeah. And it's and the way he – either his post-processing or his post-processing and the combination of working with light here, he, he did a fantastic job. I mean, these, these images are incredibly yeah. dramatic. Absolutely. Let's see here. All right, we'll do a couple more. It's hard because I keep finding good ones. <laughs> man, ripped up shirt, man. Okay, very good. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next one now. Um, so that was Andrew Burton. Andrew you can look up and find him. AndrewBurtonPhoto.com. He has great stuff. I mean, he has like an uh, Afghanistan uh, uh, pro- uh, project. He has uh, Baltimore Rising. Lots of good stuff. Is he is he freelance or is he actually with a publication? Uh, Do you know? Let's see. About. I'll have to look him up. I'll look him up. Let's learn about Andrew <clears throat> A Pulitzer Prize finalist, documentary photographer with a focus in news conflict. Looks like looks like freelance, but it's hard to tell. Hmm. But yeah, yeah he's, he, uh, he's a great guy to check out for anybody. Yeah, no kidding. He's young. It's impressive. Mm-hmm. So now we're going <clears throat> to look at uh, we're going to look at Alyssa uh, Schrucker, I think is the way that you say her last name. Uh, you can find her at Alicia Alyssa Schrucker dot com. A l y s s a s c h u k a r dot com. <laughs> Shukar, I'm assuming. Okay, so we're gonna look at a couple of these. Uh, we'll move. How do I switch? There we go. All right. So mm. let's see. Yeah, we'll talk about this one a little bit. You have a, people on the edge of a highway. It looks like this is sort of a rescue collection point where these people are these people are just being pulled out of boats at the the edge of a. A highway yeah, I remember overpass. I the top of the highway where they were dropping people off and then taking them in dump trucks. So that's this is that mm. intersection. That's Braceway. Okay, is where the okay. Is. gotcha. Yeah, so you have this this really old lady who has a walker. You can tell that she would not have fared well if they did not rescue her. Uh, and once again, just remind you of the people who are the most vulnerable in these types of situations. Yeah. Lots of humanity in this in this stuff. 
Um, let's see. It was, and it was just such a great equalizer too, right? Like oh, sure, nobody yeah. had anything at this point. So yeah, here's people in a dump truck being rescued, and then the dump truck is submerged. It's like the dump truck <clears throat> is not moving anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I. I uh, let's see. Did you go anywhere? Are you still there? Hello. Oh no, I think I lost him. Oh, no, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay, we just had a little little hiccup. Yeah, sorry. I was just listening. Okay, that's good. That's good to listen sometime. We need more listeners in the world. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so um a really interesting shot. It's like this was the it's a dump truck half submerged in water. This was their this was their cavalry and now their cavalry is underwater and the police are on yeah. top of the front with there's a dog on in a cage <laughs> on top of this well, but the police are going, Hey, someone help us like it had to be incredibly overwhelming at that point. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. Amazing image. Great photo though. Uh, this one I found interesting. Uh, it's a picture of a, a few people in the back of a truck and they've been just been rescued. It seems like a lot of the stuff she, she's been capturing is people who are just rescued <clears throat> and you have a guy who looks, yeah. is kind of falling asleep, looks exhausted with his kid laying on his, his uh, chest and either puppy or stuffed animal uh, just laying on his chest. They look like they've just been through a lot. The expressions are incredible. Then you have this guy on the right, which is a true Texan. He's got his rifle inside. That's a gun. <laughs> he's yep. got, got it. If he's probably, got, yeah, he probably left thing. his wife behind to keep his gun. The things you decide to grab, right? So the father right. is, is made sure he had his cell phone. The kid has a stuffed animal, and the old man's got his rifle. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it. All right, let's see here. Rescue worker, just a nice portrait of a rescue worker on top of a highway, which is really interesting and an intense expression of exhaustion, like he's just been going nonstop. Beautiful stuff. Got a guy searching through the water flashlight in the water just looking around for probably a little bit of what you found yeah uh really dramatic i I love this because when the the night comes around in this sort of situation you're just having the lighting of the the flashlights Mm -hmm. and some of the street lights and it it creates a really dramatic intense look to all the photos that you I see, see. And, yeah, the guys. These people, so these are all in Katy, Texas, which is West Houston. Their situation was rough because they right. got the rain, and then when the reservoirs got full, then they released the, the dams, and so all these people flooded again. Mm. And because it was a man-made flood, because they physically released the water from the dam, their flood insurance doesn't cover it. Oh, no <laughs> way. Screwed. Wow. Yeah, it's, a, again, another one of these stories that are unfolding now um, that people are having to fight, fight out in courts. Um, That's awful. Yeah, this, but these are amazing images. Yeah. Then and it's, uh, the, what's nice for uh, her in this situation is using the flashlight as a single point of light helps, it helps focus you on whatever the image should be about. And obviously they're, shining the light towards whatever the image should be about (laughs) so um really really fantastic use of that here absolutely let's see here okay talk really quick you're having some like weird muffle muffly issues oh yeah no uh, bandwidth is being funny okay i'm good you're good you're good all right we got some rescue workers standing around in a shopping mart uh four of them they're eating a burger probably like they've never eaten one before really intense. so yeah this is a, the Bucky's is uh a legendary texas establishment they are uh these like truck stops that made a name for themselves by advertising the cleanest bathrooms in texas and they basically have built these empires and and some of these like rural county just employer and funny because they're just so successful and uh yeah they're they're meccas. People will drive many miles to go to Bucky's, and, oh, including man. rescue workers here. So, I, I've yeah. always, <laughs> I've always said that the cleanest, uh, the, the having cleaner bathrooms, that is one of the best moves a business can make. Because absolutely, I, right. I, I, I rate bathrooms hardcore. <laughs> Very important. Yup, yup, yup. So we also have some business advice here. Uh, this one's a really interesting one. You have a, uh, I, I, I didn't realize this before, but. 
you have a looks like a, somebody who's helping out with the rescue efforts has his army um uniform laid out on the ground organized fashion because they're pretty organized people and uh, just feet hanging out of the the blankets on a bed looks like they're the the person is just out been working so well, hard and so what you don't know in this just looking at the picture you kind of have to be in houston to understand this. so gallery furniture um is this furniture store um where the guy came to houston bankrupt and now he's built this like furniture empire his name is uh jim mackinville mm. up his showrooms as shelters so like you know mattresses and furniture that the guy was supposed to be selling to keep his business going he decided to open up his door and you know people who were either flooded but also obviously first responders could come in and you know get some much needed rest so that's actually what you're seeing here that's a, a brand new Tempur-Pedic mattress that was on the showroom floor where you have a rescuer here that's so, a, that's amazing I'm glad you brought that context to this and I think that that person's probably getting the best sleep of their life because I know that Tempur-Pedics <laughs> are great mattresses right. <laughs> yeah right so like you had average business owners also become very heroic in doing everything that they could to you know keep the rescue effort going yeah very very thoughtful composition here tell tell it's interesting yeah, it's to, the way that it tells a story by adding all of these elements absolutely this was my favorite photo of the entire yeah. uh the what would you call this collection but uh it's a picture of a uh, man and his his little his uh, child. Let's see. Gerald Sam embraces his one year old son as they try to sleep at the George R. Brown Convention Center in downtown Houston. But I love this because it's it just didn't, I I have a soft spot for fatherhood to begin with. But but uh, this yeah. is just beautiful. I mean, just the the I, I guess the protection that a father is after that it, he I'm sure he would have he would have he would have kicked a wall through to get to his son to save him. And and that's all demonstrated yeah. here in just a simple photo of them sleeping with his arm around his son. Yeah, amazing image. Yeah, the Georgia Brown had, I think, you know, upwards of 15,000 evacuees at some point, uh, people that lost everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, this man has everything, right? Because he has his child. Right. Oh, and, yeah, he's, uh, con he's content right now. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, Stun, stunning image, absolutely stunning image. Yeah, incredible photo. This might be the thumbnail because it's a pretty good photo. Okay. I'll have to pick between a lot of good photos within this <laughs> this uh, journey here. So, okay, I'm gonna we're gonna stop there. I'm gonna. Oh uh, yeah, it's 11:30 here. Wow, to, we've been, oh, we've I gotta, been going. you gotta go to bed, man. <laughs> All right, back to the photos. I mean, back to us rather. Let me get this out of the way. All right. Beautiful. I'm going to be screen sharing with you. You guys get to look at my beautiful face. Our beautiful face. Do you faces. like the hair? Oh, thanks. Let's see. Have you seen me since I cut my hair? Yes. I think we did one. And then obviously I see your, your videos and ah, yes. pictures. So. That was really the question. Do you follow me? Let's Absolutely. <laughs> okay, very good. So. Uh, so I think we'll, that, that'll be it. I think we've had a fantastic conversation thus far and thank yeah, you so thank much you. Uh, thank you so I, uh, much for letting me i want to go be thoughts. andrew this uh shoe card i want to go be these photojournalists they uh they blow us out of the water <laughs> right right, right. <clears throat> no they uh they they have excellent work and it's uh it's definitely something to str to strive for and use as oh, a you yeah. use as a, a a point of reference and look at the little things that they do better than you do as a photographer not you but like everybody right Absolutely. The little things and the big things, obviously. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> I like it. All the things. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Well, we're going to exactly. wrap it up here. Um, thank you again. And they can find you on Instagram at uh, Duke Fo uh, Fojo, F O J O, correct? Still what it correct, is. Correct, right? yes. Yeah. And then you have a website too, right? Yeah, I'm not so great about keeping it updated at the moment, but yes, it's uh, Michael Duke Photo. MichaelDukePhoto.com. Sorry, you cut out. Correct. Yeah, MichaelDukePhoto.com. Beautiful. And this is um, on his Instagram page is a good place to see a lot of his work around Harvey and onward. And he is a, a prolific street photographer. 
as well. Puts out a lot of really interesting stuff. And I came across you that way because of your, uh, just your, your really interesting personal photography and how you, you seem to get, you seem to interact with, with your community in the, in the way that you shoot and, and the stories that you try to tell both on the street. And of course, in terms of Harvey here. I appreciate it, my friend. And I, uh, gotta tell you, I draw a lot of inspiration from you. I think, uh, your skills and enthusiasm really uh, are great drivers. So I appreciate that contribution to my work. That's super awesome to hear. And it's funny. We're both like, we're both really, uh, we have a lot of humility and we kind of, we kind of hang out in that, that little self of steam realm in a sense, which is a good way to be. But like you say that to me and I don't believe it. So I'll have to, I'll have to make myself (laughs) believe it. Well, trust me. It's the truth. (laughs) Thanks man. Cool. Well, bye, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Please feel free to engage, and goodbye.